All right, this is section three of the Civil Rights Movement Notes. While the SNCC, or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, had made mo voter education uh, projects a priority of theirs in Mississippi, it had been met with violent opposition and very little success. So in 1964, they called for a major campaign known as the Freedom Summer. About a thousand white and African American students um, were supposed to go to Mississippi, focus on registering African Americans to vote. The reason for this was because of these Jim Crow laws, even to go and register to vote as an African American voter was met with a lot of um, unnecessary detours. Uh, we'll put it that way. Um, they made it very hard or impossible for African American uh, voters to, or African American citizens to vote in some states. Um, and Mississippi was one of them. And so the need for the Freedom Summer was to send people down that understood the process, to help citizens there walk through it and maybe actually get some people registered. Um, they also formed the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party to serve as an alternative to the state's all-white regular Democratic Party. Before the volunteers arrived, over three civil rights workers disappeared. SNCC claimed they had been murdered, but state authorities claimed uh, or denied that claim. President Johnson ordered a massive search, and the bodies were found with fatal point-blank gunshot wounds. Um, I'm going to show you, like I said, some some video of this, some footage of them bringing um, the car up out of a river. Anyway, um, they definitely were murdered by members of the KKK, and uh, it was meant to try to deter... Uh, other members from SNCC and uh, civil rights workers from coming to the state. In August of 1964, after the Freedom Summer, um, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and Fannie Lou Hamer, one of their prominent speakers, traveled to the Democratic Convention in New Jersey. Despite her passionate speech in which she recounted what so many African Americans went there simply to register to vote, the Democrats refused to give the MFDP seats the convention. <coughs> Early in 1965, Martin Luther King Jr. and Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or the SCLC, organized a massive campaign in Selma, Alabama, to pressure the federal government to enact voting rights legislation. So that's voting rights laws. In other words, laws passed to protect your right to vote. The protests climaxed in a series of con confrontations on the Edmund Pettus Bridge on the main route from Selma to Montgomery. On March 7th, a 1965, um, this is also known as Bloody Sunday, first of the confrontations. Heavily armed stampers attacked the marchers as they tried to cross the bridge. So as they were getting ready to cross the bridge, you can see on the next slide, I've got some pictures. State troopers were waiting uh, for the marchers. They weren't breaking the law, um, you, know, at, at, you know, law as we see it today anyway. It was law in Alabama that day. Um, but they... We're simply marching from, um, from some, anyway, you'll see it on the next slide. Um, troopers were there and they beat these marchers. Um, anyway, here's a quote from one of the, from one of the marchers. Some of them had clubs and others had ropes and whips. It was like a nightmare. These are state officers, um. I just knew then that I was going to die. That is Cheyenne Webb, and she was six years old when she marched or attempted to march across the Hemingway Pettus Bridge. TV coverage of the violence outraged the country. In March 15, 1965, so well over a week later, President Johnson went on national television, television and called for a strong federal voting rights law. While historically voting rights have been left to the states, just like education have been left to the states, Johnson argued that it is, quote, wrong to deny any of your fellow citizens the right to vote. Their cause is your cause, too. It is not just African Americans, but really it is all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy and bigotry and injustice. And this is the important part of his quote. He says, and we shall overcome. That, what, the last three words there are also the title of a gospel song, and it kind of became the anthem for the nonviolent um, civil rights activists and protesters. 
they would sing that. And so him saying that in his address to the country was, you know, a sign that he saw what they were doing and agreed with what they were doing. And, and that was kind of his little subtle nod to, I see you and I, and I see what you're doing and I will try to help you. So here's some of those pictures I was, I was talking about. So that picture on the top left, that right there has their motto on it and that banner um, of some protesters marching. The picture in the top row in the middle, those are the three civil rights workers who went missing um, that were later found with those gunshot wounds after they were murdered. <coughs> the picture on the bottom left is the successful march, uh, finally, uh, across the bridge in Selma, or from Selma, excuse me. The bottom center, those are the officers waiting for the marchers to cross the bridge. You can see the bridge in the background and them marching that way. And then the picture on the far right, yeah, that is the violence that awaited them. And the man getting beaten in this picture that you can see, the, the police officers got him, got a hold of him, and he's, he's got his nightstick, and he's getting ready to hit him. That is actually... Uh, John Lewis, and he was a, a member of the federal government for years. He just recently passed away. He was a civil rights activist. He's in some video I'm going to show you. Um, and he marched with Dr. L Dr. Martin Luther King uh, really for the entirety of, of the civil rights movement. Later on, became a, a, a representative himself. So that's who that is. Spurred by both the actions of the protesters and the words, of the president, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act of 1965. This banned literacy test, I don't know if you remember us talking about literacy tests in the fall, came out right after the end of the, the end of the Civil War, and, and because you, African American men got the right to vote um, at the end of the Civil War with the, uh, the 15th Amendment. So Southern states started to pass different Jim Crow laws they were different in each state. We talked about that. And some of them were literacy tests. So African-American males couldn't vote unless they were able to pass these different tests. And I'm telling you, we couldn't pass some of these tests. They, they were made impossible to pass. Um, and it was discriminatory against African-American and, and really any minority. Coverage uh, was to expand to Hispanic voters in 1975. All right. The 24th Amendment was ratified and added to the Constitution in 1964. That banned the poll tax. Now, I will tell you, the Voting Rights Act, what it did, banning literacy tests, and then the 24th Amendment, banning the poll tax on the vocab test, that we'll take here in a couple of weeks. Students constantly get those two things mixed up, so make sure you study and know the difference between those two. Court cases, Baker versus Carr and Reynold versus Sims, limited racial gerrymandering. Um, we'll talk some more about this a little bit later. Gerrymandering, if you don't know, it's drawing election districts in a way to empower or dilute certain votes. So I'll show you an example of what that could look like, um, but it really does allow certain candidates or certain parties from guaranteeing that they are able to keep their seat by knowing which neighborhoods are going to vote for them and which aren't. Like, I'll, I'll show you some examples of this. After these laws, and that's still something that you can do as well, gerrymandering, it's, it's not illegal, it's still perfectly legal to do that. After these laws, African Americans registered to vote. Um, a registered to vote in Mississippi went from 7% in 1964 to 70% by 1986. The number of African-American elected officials went from 100 in the whole country to 6,000 by the mid-80s. And then you can see in the graph on the right side of the, the slide the difference just in four years of percentage of, of African-American uh, voter registration. Less than a week after Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, one of the worst race riots in American history erupted in <clears throat> predominantly, predominantly African-American neighborhood of Watts in Los Angeles. This is the Watts riot, if you've ever heard that phrase. 
Violence, looting, and arson spread for several days after the, or before, rather, the National Guard restored order. Other race riots occurred after Watts, such as Newark and Detroit in 1967. 43 people died in Detroit, and property damage reached $50 million. The violent and many white Americans, frightened many white Americans, excuse me. In previous race riots, the violence had been used by whites against African Americans, but now African Americans are using violence against police in white businesses and predominantly black neighborhoods. To determine the cause of the riots, Johnson created the Kerner Commission. Uh, the Kerner Commission concluded that long-term racial discrimination stood as the single most important cause of violence and recommended establishing and expanding federal programs aimed at overcoming the problems of America's poorest neighborhoods. So we'll talk some more about this. I've got some different video clips to show you about this as well. Um, Johnson did not follow up on the findings of the Kerner Commission um, because of some other things going on. Uh, anyway, like the Vietnam War, which we'll talk about Vietnam later as well. And I know it's hard to, to kind of keep all this in mind because I don't go chronologically. Um, in this class, I kind of go by topic. So it'll kind of feel, I know I've said this before, like we're in the 60s forever. Um, and we are in the 60s for a long time because so many different things happen in that decade. But try to remember that all these things are layered on top of each other. Well, many uh, radicals in Martin Luther King's nonviolence uh, movement were present in the 60s. The most well-known uh, was Malcolm X, born Malcolm Little. He's from Omaha, Nebraska, so he adopted X. Uh, changed his name to represent his lost African name and claimed that Little was the name given to him as, as his when his family were slaves. He had a difficult childhood, becoming involved in drugs and crime, eventually arrested uh, and sent to prison for burglary when he was 21 years old. While he was in prison, he became a convert to the Nation of Islam. Its strict rules of behavior, no drugs or alcohol, and called for the separation of the races. I have a video about Malcolm X that will kind of talk about his background that uh, I'll put on Google Classroom as well to expand on some of that stuff that you might have questions about. After his release from prison, Malcolm X became the Nation of Islam's most prominent minister. In 1964, though, he broke away from the Nation of Islam and formed his own organization. He made the pilgrimage to Mecca, which, uh, if, if you are um, a Muslim, making that trip is a really big part of your faith. It's the holy city uh, for the nation of, or for, for people of the Muslim faith. And he became a lot more accepting of, of whites after that. In February of 1965, Malcolm X was shot and killed. Three members of the Nation of Islam were convicted for his murder. Many young African Americans saw themselves as heirs to the radical Malcolm X. Remember, he, he wasn't radical for his whole life because um, he did leave uh, the Nation of Islam and, and that more violent and more non-welcoming kind of ideas behind. Um, but he was killed, you know, not too long after he changed his mind on that from former, or from members from the Nation of Islam. But anyway, um, but a lot of African Americans did I say a lot, some younger African Americans moved away from this nonviolent movement and ideas of Dr. King and began to question the goal of integration. Um, so one of the most uh, prominent ones, one you might have heard of before, uh, is Stokely Carmichael. And he says, integration has been based on complete acceptance of the fact that in order to have a decent house or education, Blacks must move into a white neighborhood and send their children to a white school. This reinforces the notion that, quote, white is automatically better than, quote, black, and is by, and that, excuse me, is automatically better, and that, quote, black is by definition inferior. Um, he said that in 1966. Um, he was a leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee when he said that. Um, he just had some different ideas about integration and and some of them, you know, weren't as anchored in being nonviolent. Uh, he was also the first to use the term black power in 1966. In that year, James Meredith set off uh, 
on a march against fear. I'm going to show you some video of that uh, next week. Um, set off on, on his march against fear. He's the guy that integrated the Mississippi or the University of Mississippi. Was the Air Force veteran. Um, so that's him. Try to remember that. So he was going to walk across uh, the state of Mississippi, and it was to encourage African Americans to go and register to vote. He only made it 20 miles before he was shot and left for dead by a white supremacist. Um, the SNCC Corps and the SCLC members continued the march for him since he was shot. Uh, wasn't killed, but anyway, Carmichael and other members were arrested when they reached Greenwood, Mississippi. After his release, Carmichael told a crowd that African Americans needed, quote, black power, which he later said meant economic and political influence, but whites felt threatened and believed that black power meant violence. Not long after his black power speech, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale, there's a picture of them on the bottom of this slide, formed the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California. Almost overnight, the Black Panthers became the symbol of young militant African Americans. They organized armed patrols of urban neighborhoods to protect people from police abuse. They also created anti-poverty programs such as free breakfast for poor African American children. They gained national attention when they entered the state capital of California in Sacramento, carrying shotguns and wearing black leather jackets and berets in protest or two protests, rather, two protests, rather, attempts to restrict their right to bear arms. The Panther style appealed to young African Americans who began wearing their hair in afros and referring to themselves as, quote, black. Uh, on the bottom left picture down there, um, that's Malcolm X in 1964. And then the bottom right picture, you might have seen that photograph before as well, that is the 1968 Summer Olympics, and those are U.S. athletes, uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos Reyes, glove fist in protesting discrimination. So they're on the podium there, and they had a black glove on, and while the national anthem was playing, they uh, raised their, their fist. It got a lot of attention. Well, Martin Luther King... Uh, understood the anger and frustration of many urban African Americans whose lives hadn't changed much, it didn't seem, um, despite the civil rights reforms of the 60s. He disagreed with the call for black power. After spending about a year in Chicago, he came up with a plan to pressure the nation to do more for the nation's poorest. He traveled to Memphis as part of a campaign in early 1968. Uh, we're going to spend at least a couple of days just on the year 1968, because so many things happen. Um, here's part of what happens. He also offered his assistance to sanitation workers who were striking for better wages. So he's in Memphis. April 3rd, he addressed uh, followers of his from Memphis and recognized that threats had been made against his life. And that had happened before. This wasn't the first time it had happened. Um, but he said he was not concerned about that. He said, I only want to do God's will. The next day, King was shot on his hotel balcony, and he died in a nearby hospital. He was only 39 years old. Um, a white ex-convict, James Earl Ray, was charged with his murder. Shot him across. Anyway, Robert Kennedy, who was campaigning for the presidency in Indianapolis, when he heard about King uh, being killed, he he was at this, supposed to be giving a speech. Uh, to promote his campaign, and he stopped and instead told them about what happened and, and pleaded with them not to riot because that would um, that would not be the proper way to, to honor someone like Martin Luther King's legacy was by rioting, but riots still broke out in hundreds of cities after King was killed. Um, and then two months after King is killed, Robert Kennedy also is, is assassinated. Uh, when he was running for president. That's John F. Kennedy's brother. Civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s succeeded in eliminating de jure segregation. So segregation that was imposed by law, um, it, it was drastically uh, reduced, eliminated, knocking down a lot of barriers to African Americans voting and political participation. 
African American poverty rates fell. The median income and high school graduation graduation rates for African Americans went up. Uh, in 1967, Thurgood Marshall, so one of the lawyers we talked about in the first section of these notes, the help with the Brown v. Board case, he became the first African American Supreme Court justice. In 1969, the Fair Housing Act is Fair Housing Act is passed, which banned discrimination in housing. Attempts to increase the economic opportunities for African Americans and to integrate neighborhoods and schools encountered more difficulties. So. Some of that is because de facto segregation is hard to mandate. Um, and I told you schools, um, it would take a while to, to kind of achieve desegregating schools, even though Brown v. Board was passed. Federal courts had to order forced busing to achieve school integration at all. Nixon criticized this measure of achieving racial balance during his own presidency. He wins in 1968. Um, the Nixon administration established affirmative action, which we'll talk about, as a means to close the economic gap. Uh, affirmative action was controversial from the start, as some whites claimed it was reverse discrimination, um, which I don't, I just don't like that phrase, reverse discrimination. It's, anyway, um, but what they mean is it, well, we'll, uh, we'll talk about Nixon more, so I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Thurgood Marshall disagreed and believed that until the nation dealt with the legacy of slavery and what it left behind in a real way, equal rights and opportunity would be uh, difficult to provide, which, which he's right about that. It is equal, or is difficult to provide that and mandate that. Um, so, the last part here, the de facto segregation, that's hard to mandate. We'll kind of look when we get to Nixon and we get to JFK and, and Johnson's presidencies, which are kind of in their own section of notes, um, some different things they attempted to, to deal with de facto segregation, like busing and affirmative action. Um, I'm not going to go into it here, but just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. All right, these are your checkpoint questions that go with the end of this section of notes. Uh, make sure you answer those, and that does it for this chapter of notes, civil rights.